Uh, the, uh, this, this movie is really good because it explains so much of what we're seeing in the world today. Yes. And my wife and I just a couple of days ago we were talking about how the, the, the climate, the political climate, is like the purveyors of hate are in ascendancy now. Yeah. So they're kind of winning the day. You know, and you're hating the immigrants, the, the undocumented workers, the gays, what, you know, whatever group, you know, hating the scientists for telling us about the climate change. And, you know, it's just okay to be hateful and, you know, just to block out every bit of reason or every bit of rationality, you know, because it's just like your belief and that's the way it's going to be, you know. And so I thought that was really good and how these, and, and in the movie, I thought it was really good. They were talking about how, you know, it's like almost like uh, the people that survived are the people that thought they were, that there actually was a snake in the grass. Right. You know? And so it's like these purveyors of hate are like saying, oh, look at those guys, you know, those, there's snakes in the grass, you know, look at them and we got to get them and be careful and watchful and, you know, uh, bar them from traveling in our country, you know, and because there's snakes in the grass. Right. You know, and that kind of like, you know, that's it's like so many people, it's like ready to jump on that and go, yes, yes, there's snakes in the grass. Right. You know, and so it's like they really, it's clever how <laughs> they work that out, you know what I mean? By hook or crook, that's that's really has actually worked. Politically. I, I think if you take it, and, and I'd like to have Chad and my wife come in more because these guys are college educated, I'm just a filmmaker, but... Um, but when we start off from the beginning, when we're talking about survival mechanisms and how we survived in groups, if you really think about it at the bare bone necessities, how we have operated to survive, a lot of this actually makes sense, right? We had to survive in groups with each other. And in order to defend our groups, just like most animals, we had to be able to identify what was different or a threat, you know, a snake, an animal, whatever. So we had the same brains as we had from back then. And so when we see someone from an out group, that is different, we're automatically gonna subcategorize them as this, and the brain's automatically gonna have a, an assumption of what you believe or think or perceive about that person or that group or that whatever it is. So it was meant to keep us alive, to keep us from threats. But now we have a new way of living and being, and but we're still having the same old brain. So this is what we're seeing is, what I believe, and this is just my personal opinion, is, is that I think the world feels, whether it's real or perceived, that there is a greater threat in that world and people are trying to identify what it is. I think people feel a lot of uncertainty. They feel a lot of fear, which is why I wanted to bring it up in the film. And when people have a lot of uncertainty and fear, you'll notice that they'll gravitate to uh, people that might give them the solutions like Caleb was talking about. And sometimes, unfortunately, that's ideological people. That's ideological belief systems. We saw that with Nazi Germany when they were truly afraid after World War I and a lot of these people were desperate for an answer to get help. And so they would turn to these, these people that would say things to give them the certainty. And that's what I feel is happening now with probably technological change, you know, terrorism, uh, global economy. There's so much change happening at once and people are just looking for this kind of foundation of this answer. And I think the fear that I have is most people are turning to irrational belief systems, which we've always done. We, we've always, you know, when we used to believe in the sun god Ra, you know, it, it's not that the people were stupid. They didn't know how to understand why their friends and family were dying, what diseases were, what. So we have to understand that when people come to their belief systems and how they come to their belief systems and why. And if you look at it from a scientific point of view, it actually makes more sense. But I would like to have somebody much more qualified than me to talk about that a little bit. So maybe we could start at the beginning. How I brought uh, Chad into the film was I went to a skeptics conference out in Flagstaff and he had a really great talk about talk about um, the sun god Ra and even in Egypt. So maybe you can go a little bit into that and really what was it that was causing Egyptians even back then? I mean, they built great temples. They've, they've built an entire society around it. Maybe we could start back how we were as tribalistic societies and what made us to believe in these systems like the sun god Ra. Huh? <laughs> um, yeah, I'll give you the elevator lecture on, on that real quick. Um, it just it struck me, so this is something I lecture on quite a bit, but, uh, but you know, it definitely comes from my own life, where, uh, where uh, at 16 I was a born-again Christian, and, uh, and I was in world history class, and we started studying about all these ancient Egyptian gods. And, well, what the, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, I know there is only one true God. How is it that they believed there were so many? And he's the sun god, oh, well, okay. Yeah, I mean, as I think said in the film, uh, if you look at, this, at the sun, you go blind. You can't get anywhere near the realm that the sun occupies. Uh, your life is dependent on the sun, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of ways to understand how, certainly back in 7000 BCE anyway, that, uh, that folks 
I, I'm sure I would have believed the sun was a god back then. I have no doubt. About, well, I can't, can't predict perfectly. But, uh, but it seems it was the best explanation that one had. Uh, we come up today, and I, I get into trouble, trouble sometimes with Navajo students in this lecture when I say no one believes the sun is a god anymore. I mean, I guess apparently there are some Navajo beliefs that still look at the sun as, as, a, as a spiritual element within, uh, within their um, I don't know if doctrine's the right word. But uh, <clears throat> for the most part, none of us even contemplate. Most of us never even question, the, have never even had the thought, is the son of God. Why not? Because it just ain't useful anymore. It doesn't explain anything better than the physical explanation does. The physical explanation, if you want to build solar cells, if you want to send satellites into orbit and, and study the sun, the, the physical model of the sun is the only one that's going to allow you to do it. You're not going to send a, sor orbit, sorry, a satellite into orbit under a God-based theory of the sun. It's just not going to get you there. I think we can all agree on that. Um, then for me, as a psychologist, I think an analogous issue today, in the same way that 7,000 BC, it was, I could see how people believed the sun was a god. I can see how today many, particularly folks who aren't uh, up on the science, yeah, the essence of who an individual is must be the soul. I mean, think about the magnificence of, of, of a human being and all the, the, the perplexity and the, the wonder. and the, um, it's, it's, it's really hard to figure out how the essence of who I am could be boiled down to physical matter. Now, we did it with the sun, but most people, you know, the sun's a rock or something like that. Right? The mind's not. Well, that's where we're at right now. Science is, is, is putting us well on the road to being able to model the, the, the magnificence of who we are in purely physical terms without having to appeal to a supernatural realm that, if, frankly, has no explanatory power whatsoever. So uh, that's kind of my kick right now. And what I'm always trying to convince at least my students of is that I know many of you are here thinking that the essence of who you are is this immutable soul. Uh, but... Consider the possibility, consider how much greater life could be if we come up with a good physical understanding of exactly what a human being is. I have no idea what I'm, point I'm addressing, but hopefully. No, I, 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 was, I was really just, and I think what we're starting off from is the foundation of how m for many years we've come to beliefs. We believed in many different types of gods for a very long time. And again, it wasn't that we were stupid or dumb. It was just that was the best explanation for us to understand how does that work? I don't know if you guys remember at the beginning when we showed the little squares that were moving around with the circles, the animism. When most people look at that, they're, they're telling themselves a story, right? They're like, oh, the square is being affected by the triangle and the triangle is being affected by, but there's just shapes moving, right? We put the meaning to it, but that's what we've done for thousands of years is we, we put these meanings to things. We put meanings to, you know, why do people die? Why do we get diseases? Why this, you know? So the, the challenge is really understanding what is the reasons that we did that? What, why do we tell stories? Michael Shermer talks about that, you know, storytelling. Storytelling is one of the best ways for us to learn something, right? Like, and, I, and, and, and my personal experience as a filmmaker, our goal is to be able to create a character. Like if I make a fictional film, the goal is to write and create a character that has some sort of conflict and he's supposed to understand the conflict. The whole point of a drama is that this character throughout any film, no matter what it is, is going to go through conflict, 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 conflict. The movie's over when it, he resolves the conflict, right? That's why a television show will never end until the actual resolution is ended on it, okay? We are problem-solving creatures. Since we've been in the jungles, all we've tried to do was try to understand how do we solve problems? How do I stay alive? How do I keep my family fed, right? But we were more likely to, I could more likely teach you something if I told you a story. So I go out into the jungles, I'm hunting, I'm gathering whatever else. Maybe you didn't go out there. You're more likely to survive if I tell you the story of what happened while I was out there, right? I'm going to tell you what I did throughout my day to help you to survive. Does it make sense? But as we started to tell these stories, that's how I believe religion came into being. As we said, well, I don't understand this, but you seem to be moving and you seem to be moving and that animal's moving. So there must be some form of animism. So, and the sun's moving. So there must be some sort of animism. So you're just putting two and two together, creating a story. And that's what we do. We're storytelling creatures. And that's why I put the storytelling aspect on it. Question yeah. From the audience. Yeah, so I, I believe so, but it seems to me that um, science is failing and ideo ideology is winning. Hmm. Even though we're obviously learning more about the world all along the way through science. But science does, scientists do a really lousy job of promoting themselves and getting across the fact that this, you have to go through this process to get down to the truth. And so I, I'm wondering, do you ever show this film to ideology groups or 
non-science based type people and it's like well, so f well, this is actually brand new. You guys are like the third group of people to ever see the film. So we're still we're actually working on a tour right now to go to colleges and universities. But we did bring that up, and I think that I would like to. And I've talked to a couple pastors. I said I'd like to be able to show this in your guys' church to have a conversation. And I think the problem in our societies now is that we're afraid to reach out to anybody that has a different point of view than us and have any conversation. Like I'm the first person to criticize our president and all the dumb going on in Washington right now. But at the same time, if you don't understand how somebody came to their beliefs about why they voted for the president or why they believe what they're doing, we're not going to get anywhere. And if we call ourselves critical thinkers, honestly, we're going to have to have some sort of civil conversations. It's easy to criticize. I criticize people all the time. Believe me, join my Facebook. You'll notice. But the reality is, is that if we really want to solve a problem, we need to be able to sit down and figure out where is that person coming from? How do we, how do we gain a dialogue into doing that? So we would like to be able to show this film um, to organizations and people that might have a different point of view. I did want to address what he said about, I don't know if you guys have had the same experience or what he's talking about in terms of scientists not being able to um, really, I guess, promote themselves properly. And that's something where I don't know how you guys feel about the March for Science that's coming up in, in April. If you join that Facebook group, there are so many scientists kind of coming out of the closet in that group. It's amazing. There's a ton of scientists now that are running for um, political offices. So I would urge, you know, I, it's too bad he got up and left, but I would have urged him to, to join that group and, and to really seek out because I, I know it may not seem like it because the mainstream media doesn't promote it, but there are so many scientists that are out there trying to do things like Bill Nye the Science Guy. He's amazing and has a whole new show coming out. So... There are scientists out there. We just have to seek them out, and we have to try to break this um, anti-intellectualism that's taking place in society. I don't know where that has stemmed from or why it continues to be perpetuated, but it's out there. <laughs> Great philosophy. Right. Other? Yes, course. So uh, it seems like when any person or any group of people go and why this happened, why they got no reason. The person with the best gift to give and the best story yes. is who usually ends up leading them onward, you know, and, and mm -hmm. whoever that bullshit story is, yep. you know, it answers the question why, even though it's not scientifically based. It answers the question why and they all calm down. True. You're absolutely that's right. What religion is, is somebody getting up front and saying, you, you all asked me the question why, and I'm going to give you an answer, so follow me. You know, and by the way, I need money. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, what's interesting about that is, is that just like um, Jennifer Whitson was saying in the film, we're emotional creatures, and emotion is kind of a shortcut way to thinking, like going back to survivalism for a minute. If there was a lion or something in the jungle, I don't have time to critically analyze, is that a lion, is he big? I, I'll get killed instantly. So emotions are a quicker way for me to respond. So when an ideologue or a politician or even a religious person can tap into the emotional aspects of people, they're more likely to respond and not critically think. And, and I believe there's parts of the brains that shut down when you have fear with um, logic and, and reason. Can you talk a little bit, do you, are you? Yeah, there's, um, <clears throat> there's some, kind of curious research looking at uh, metabolism, right, uh, and blood gluco glu glucose, just, uh, you know, how much energy, and when, uh, when people go through ritualistic pra practices, that's generally a, a demanding, taxing event whereby their blood glu glucose, am I still saying it wrong? <laughs> blood glucose is reduced, uh, and, and it's well demonstrated that with low energy levels, low bl blood glucose, your ability to critically think is diminished. And so one thing, uh, I mean, there are many roles that a ritual plays, say, in a church, but certainly one role it seems to play, and, and not just church, I mean, we use rituals across the board, right? And, and the theory would be that just about with any of those, particularly the more energy demanding they are, the, the, the more susceptible you are to believing what follows, right? So you've, you've got an age-old practice that was never, you know, I, I'm certainly not uh, into this idea that e religion's an evil thing that some you know, group of people are, are uh, um, uh, imposing on us, but rather, I, I think it's, well, as, as Shermer said, it seems like for the most part, 
people could have beliefs like in ghosts and stuff, and it doesn't really knock them out of the gene pool. Uh, now, I think with beliefs in God, it, it almost seems like in many ways it goes the other way. That is, certainly one's uh, claiming membership to a religious organization. I, I would imagine there have been plenty of cases throughout history where that actually helped them spread their genes as opposed to heart. So I'm not sure that it's necessarily bad for, for one evolutionarily. Uh, to, it's just that today we, we have such a different set of circumstances than uh, the ones that led to the genes that we have. Uh, it's, it's making it very difficult. I, if I may, um, sorry, your name? Sure. Paul, uh, I, I liked your comment. I, I've, I've been there too. I, I, I've lately come to worry about how much I'm using a stereotype of the other side because I realize, I, well, this is what the conservative person is. And I thought, well, wait a minute. But then when I go in and talk to a conservative person, they don't really fit that mold. One thing I'm learning, as much as I would like to be able to write off what their belief systems are as being predicated on hate, and I think that's, I've got to argue that's way too simple. There's much more going on, and, and the people I've talked to do not see themselves as haters, and, and frankly, I don't see them as haters. I'm, I don't understand how they have the beliefs they have, but I'm convinced there are plenty of good people, non-haters, on the other side, and, and in fact, some of them, they seem to think they are the oppressed people. Have you, have you talked to these folks? Has anybody talked to them? There are people that are white, Middle class, you know, they're the privileged class, yet they see political correctness, as, which is a ridiculous and a term that doesn't actually refer to anything as far as I can tell, but to, to sum it up, that they see this left-based, uh, you know, um, uh, transgender bathrooms and, and gay marriage and all this stuff as actually oppressing them. And so, I, I think it's ridiculous. I mean, I can't imagine how they could, but they do legitimately believe it. The point is not how, can I see how they believe it so much as, can I see that they do believe it? Because if I, if I fail to recognize that they really believe they are coming from a good place and that their ideas are, are purely good, then I'm not going to be able to interact with them very successfully. I, and I've, I've debated with a lot of my liberal friends, my, my wife being one of these. Uh, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm as liberal as anybody, okay? So I don't, it's not that I'm, I'm somewhere on the other. It's just that I don't see any point in that attitude of, all right, you know, if, if this is your attitude, then you and I have nothing to talk about. I don't, I don't get that one. I mean, I feel that way sometimes. But if I want to move forward, I don't understand how that. So I, I feel like the more we can stop uh, relying on our stereotype, which again, which we all do, it's just a natural function, but the more we can actually be educated about what the thought process is, you know, if it's ideology, what are those ideologies? And, and I would say the, the best, <laughs> it's a little hokey, but the best way is to lead by example. That is, uh, churches are so big and so popular because they do a lot of good for their practitioners. There's plenty of data that show that people that attend church, and this is true for synagogues or mosques, right? I'm mean, probably all familiar with these data. It doesn't actually matter what your religious beliefs are. What matters is that you're going regularly to, the, they have higher happiness, greater life satisfaction, lower stress rates, less suicide, or lower suicide rates than folks that don't go to church regularly. Now, that doesn't, to me, convince me that God is, you know, that he's been, I think it's, you know, it's a function of social humans that these people, they've got something right there. They're getting together. And it's kind of like you guys are, right? I think, forgive me wrong, but it sounds like maybe you're, you're creating your own of this sort. And it doesn't rot. And that's, that seems to be the whole point. Can we, can we foster, can we, can we bring folks together in this way without using the mythology? And if we, if, if we can show that, you know, we do better, sure, you have, you know, than, than the typical atheist, you have higher lives. But us atheists who are part of this organization, I mean, if we're using science to guide our development rather than religion, then we necessarily are going to succeed greater. We're going to be happier. We're going to have lower stress. And, and eventually, they're going to, man, those atheists sure are happy. And right now, they think we're a bunch of angry assholes, right? Uh, oh, I am. Though. Right, right. It, am. It's because, see, that's the stereotype. You pervade the, the stereotype. stereotype. <laughs> but, um, and, and I don't know, maybe we destroy ourselves before this happens, but I do think ultimately, in the same way that science helps us harness the sun's energy better, science is going to help us understand who the hell we are better and be able to live and be happier that way. And, and, and if we've got long enough for that to happen, then Christianity, the same way that people just don't even bother thinking of the sun as a god anymore, eventually they're not going to bother thinking of the essence of who an individual is as a soul because it's not going to give them any utility. I've been talking way too long. Okay. <laughs> any other questions? So I, I think what you just talked about here, the stories that were, you know, we tell. So it's like, yeah, they may have started out with a great, great deal of usefulness, uh, but then they somehow along the way morphed into something dangerous. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, I think that's the potential that we're seeing today uh, with some of the stories that our president says. They, they seem rather dangerous to me. 
I guess I would claim they were always dangerous. I don't yeah, really I, th- I think I think they were always dangerous. Yeah. We're talking like expanding the military to a significant level, and we're already spending more than you know the, the top five countries in the world, and just in our budget alone. And he's talking about expanding it even more. That's dangerous. Yeah, I think it's a different form. I think it's a different form of the technology and how we're using it. Where it, we've through thousands of years, we've always built armies. We've had slaves. We used to burn people at the stake. And um, Steven Pinker brings up how we actually are a, a less violent society than we've ever been too. So I agree because it's like we need to think about that. We have the technology to for the first time to completely destroy the world. So we still need to address it. But I think we are doing better. I think we get caught up a lot of times in the news, and and I do too. And it's like, oh, it looks like doom and gloom. I'm not saying that it. It's not either. But what I'm saying is that we've made a lot of progress. And and I think we need to remain focused on that progress and not just like, here's this person trying to destroy the country. Yes, we need to totally, we need to address that. But behind the scenes, all political movements have started from the ground up. All of them, the civil rights movement, uh, women's rights, every type of movement that's ever happened started from the ground up. So giving all of our energy to people that are incompetent to making decisions isn't really helping us in the end. We need to address and say, oh yeah, uh, if I talk to my microwave, I'm not gonna talk to Obama, okay? But the reality is how does that actually help us? Like us as citizens. What's gonna help us is for us to gather and say, okay, these are the ideas we're gonna try to present and we need to be grassroots and saying, this is how we bring our systems together. Because if not, what is the point of the democracy? In the end, what is the point? Most countries, and I think I was talking about this earlier with the, with the gentleman over here, most societies have failed at democracy. How many long-lasting democracies has there ever been, right? They usually fall into tyranny. Most, most of them are dictatorships throughout the world, right? A democracy can only work with the people being in the power, but if the people don't feel like they actually have the power and it's just talking, then what's the point of the democracy? Let's just go to a dictatorship. I'm fine with that. Let's go. I will go to a dictatorship right now. If we're not, if we're none of us are willing to actually be the people and speak for the voice, then we don't deserve democracy. Then let one person make all the rules. But I want to live in a democracy. I want to live in a place where I can challenge ideas. And I'm not going to give all of my energy to this jackass, I'm sorry, who thinks that. Now, when I say that about Trump, I'm not trying to say all conservatives though either, right? As liberals, we also need to be careful and and check our own party and say, hey, look, we have some things that we need to clean up in our own backyard. That's critical thinking. That's saying, look, how do we solve problems? So I agree with you, but I don't think it's all end of the world, but it can be. It can be if we don't get off our asses and actually do something about it. But I actually have, I hate to use the word faith, but I have a little bit more faith and reason that the best ideas will come about. Like in the end, you know, Galileo unfortunately was in prison for proving, you know, the world was round, but the ideas still lasted. And that's what matters is challenging the ideas and saying these ideas and how do we solve problems? I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. I care, does these ideas change? Do, do, are you a better person? Am I a better person? Are you healthy? Are you, is your family taken care of, right? Are you having better relationships? Are you finding better jobs? Where's that connection? Is that on Facebook? Is that in my political system? Is that what Hillary or Trump is sitting there having the engagement? Do they know what we're going through? They don't. But guess what? We have the technology to say all that. And we're going to figure out a way to do it, and the ideas are going to matter. And I'd like to have my wife speak because I feel like we're talking too much. So uh, I'm just going to ask if there's anybody else that has questions or comments because I. Okay. Because yeah, you went. Yeah. I'm to make two comments, and I'm coming from a. Uh, narrow point of view because as said before climate change Mm -hmm. Uh, the first thing is uh, in the film there's a description of the need for skepticism and i totally agree but for instance what's happened which puts us all in a quandary there's a book out uh, by orestes uh, a historian on uh, and she wrote a book called merchants of doubt Mm -hmm. love that yep that Merchants of Doubt raises <clears throat> what the opposition did mm-hmm. to uh, the people who wanted to restrict cigarette smoking mm-hmm. or to the climate change uh, affirmers. They raise the issue of doubt. You know, do you really have this information? Is it really true? Is it not made up? Um, and they, of course, had their Heartland Institute, yeah. you're familiar with that, and they designed this whole concept of skepticism about climate change, and of course, now we hear about climate change as a hoax and so on. Mm-hmm. Now, we advocate skepticism, right? Mm-hmm. But that's what they're doing too. 
and they're doing it in a way that is not totally, uh, let's say, scientifically illegitimate. I, I mean, behind it there is illegitimate right. you know, mm -hmm. money and there's everything else, but they are playing on a value that we have in our civilization of being skeptical. So that that's one point um, to bring up that, and then just another point from another angle, which I cope with almost daily. I always have the image and I tell people when we're working with climate change issues, how do you approach your neighbor who is either a climate change skeptic or denier or let's say agnostic, and you knock on their door and they open up the door. If you come on with science, good science, the door will be slammed in your face or they'll politely say thank you. I think that's a dilemma that we're facing today, especially in the good people that are in the Trump country. There are a lot of good people. I totally agree with, with your statements on that. How do we reach them? And actually, the strangest thing that we've been taught in the movement that I come out of is what we call the story of self. Mm -hmm. To relate it on a personal basis, but listen. Somebody says, well, uh, climate change is a hoax because it's snowing outside, right? I mean, we're down. So then you listen and you start to build on that and try and communicate with the story itself. Well, I'm from California. Uh, I can understand that because we've got a lot of rain today, but for this week. But on the other hand, I've seen a drought for two weeks straight that started 14 fires around us, okay? And it's a story of self, and then you can relate and communicate with that person even without arguing and getting in that locked position. So I bring that up kind of, but strangely enough, even if science is a value, and I am obviously the whole issue of climate change is a science issue in the end. Uh, it's also a human issue because it's going to hit us all. Um, but the most effective way of communicating is by the story of self. So I'll throw that out. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you brought that up, and that is something that we bring up in the film. Peter Bogosian actually talks about changing people's minds by teaching them to think in terms of processes and what they value. And that's really what we're trying to promote with our film, is, is, is trying to figure out what what is it that people are valuing, and that's the same thing that you're doing in terms of climate change. I mean, he and I were very familiar with what you're speaking on in terms of um, Merchants of Doubt. We actually saw a documentary that came to the Mary D. Fisher Theater, and um, that touched upon all of that. And I think that um, you're right in terms of them taking skepticism and twisting it. And that I think really, um, it angers me to no end when they do that. When um, we get into, he and I have um, unfortunately been on the Sedona Bulletin board, uh, I think it was about a year ago, and he went back and forth and got into it really deeply with some, some locals who were climate change deniers or who were promoting, well, but there's these people over here that doubt the science. So um, combating that skepticism for skepticism, you're right, doesn't work. It, it is more or less getting into the nitty gritty of each individual person who thinks that way. I don't know how we would necessarily do that with Trump, you know, when he says that it's China promoting the hoax, but, um, I'll let you take over because I know you're itching. Yeah, I just want to say something really quick in that I think it's on a spectrum of how we deal with the situation. Some people are willing to have rational conversations. I think those are the ones you need to reach out to. For everyone else, like a Trump that you can't reach out to, I mean, there's people like me out there that will just confront them on the same exact level. I don't care. Like most of the time when I confront people, it's usually the people that I know aren't going to have a rational conversation at all. But when you have a rational conversation with most people, like the average person is a rational person and if they have a different point of view, really sit down and try to figure out where the coming from. You know, I always try to watch documentaries and talk to people that have a different political point of view, different religious point of view. And I really just have a conversation and those do more than me screaming at people. Believe me, I scream at people all the time. It doesn't work. But I've had more people engage in a conversation. But when you understand why they're coming to where they're coming to with their beliefs, it's a form of empathy. If you really think about it sometimes, you know, it's easy for us to be like, oh, I don't I don't believe in fairies and, and God. And it's easy for us to get into these camps. But you know, some of these people are dealing with tragic things in their life. Some people have serious drug addiction. Some people are watching their family members dying of cancer, and this is the only system that they know. And if you don't have any empathy or compassion for people when you're speaking with them and try to figure out, 
you're really not any better than the monster you're trying to overcome. That's how I feel. I, I see most revolutionaries throughout the world, like people who've overthrown governments, whether it's Fidel Castro or anybody else, they, even George Lucas, I hate to say, became the monster he's trying to overcome. Like he said he's this, but he became just as bad. George Orwell talks about that in his book, Animal Farm. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the book Animal Farm, but here's a society, right, where these animals are trying to overthrow the humans, but they became just like the humans. We have to be very careful on how we're approaching it because then we become dogmatic. Then we become the same exact monsters. I don't really think what they're doing is skepticism. I think it is an ideology and we have to be smart enough to critically think about how do we take in information and double check it and to, and to do that. I don't have the answers and maybe you guys have better answers than me, but I don't think you're going to change their minds. I think what you're going to have to do is change the audience's mind. When I watch a debate, a public debate, I know that the two people debating aren't trying to actually change each other's minds. They're trying to change the audience member's mind. Some people ask me like, well, Ben, why do you argue with people all the time? I'm not trying to change their mind, but the people listening in on the conversation might change their mind. And I'll tell you what, that's how I changed my mind. I used to be a conspiracy theorist. I used to be a believer in new age. I was very religious. I was a very strong believer. There wasn't an atheist behind my back telling me I was wrong about anything I ever believed in. It was me just asking questions, asking questions. And then I started watching debates and I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. So you always have to value people that are having these conversations. If you guys watch the atheist experience, you guys know what show that is with Matt Dillahunty. If you ever get a chance, it's a great show. It's been on for 10 years. I'm surprised more people don't know about the show. Matt Dillahunty, he's been doing this for years. He's a great public debater. He lets theists call into the show and, to, and he talks to them and he debates them. Now, sometimes he gets the crazy people and he just hangs up on them. Don't get me wrong. But how many people have changed their mind watching that show? I bet you tons of people because they heard the arguments. They started, it wasn't just one thing that changed people's minds. I think we want to do that. We want to be in a conversation. We want to be right right now. One thing I learned is, is you have to plant a seed and let them grow it. Just like Sherman was saying, it's like, oh, that's interesting. Just plant the seed of doubt in the same way that they're trying to plant the seed of doubt, saying, well, that's interesting. Why, how did you come up with that? But it may be a couple years before they do it. Just keep planting the seed. Don't rush it. You know what I mean? Let people think of it on their own. And I guarantee if you study marketing, they'll tell you, if you let the, the, the people think that it's their idea, they're more likely to respond to it than being sold something. So my advice is that get people to just question it on their own and then they start, those wheels start to make them think, well, wait a minute, what, what about that? Or they get curious about it and they start to think about it. It takes a long time. We can't just change it. And someone like Trump isn't going to change overnight either. So let's, let's give that up real quick. So any other questions? Sorry, I didn't, but uh, just go for it. Just a comment. I was talking to Margaret. A lot of information in your film and it almost seems like too much for one viewing. Mm -hmm. I know I have a lot of things I'd like to say, but everything is just kind of working through my brain, and I can't really articulate what it is that I would like to comment and like to say. Um, a, a great film, but I'm having trouble just kind of processing all of the information. And um, I'd like to say something about that. I do purposely make films that make people think, and sometimes it does take a couple of times to watch it. And I, I'm glad actually to hear that because I think when you watch something more than once, you're more likely to retain it. I don't know if you guys noticed, there's times in the films that sometimes people said something twice. You may not have noticed it, but they may have repeated. I did that on purpose to kind of get that so people can think about it. Um, but I learned through documentaries and sometimes I've had to watch it a couple of times. So that's okay. I mean, look, I made the film and there's still some things I'm like, what? I don't understand myself. That's why I talk to people smarter than me. So th that's great. Just, I'd say when the film's released, we're going to end up releasing this like to Amazon, Netflix, stuff like that later on. So when you get a chance, or if you want to purchase the film, when it comes out, feel free to take the time, dissect it, ask questions. If you can get a hold of me and I have time, I'd be happy to answer it or, you know, anyone in the film can do that. So. That's right. I was just going to say, you know, it seems like one unfortunate thing about the environmental issues is how correlated it is with religious or political affiliation. I mean, it, you know, it just so happens that a liberal agenda is really helped <laughs> in many ways by a pro environmental stance. And indeed, a lot of what conservatives value are they're going to lose some, or at least they perceive themselves as losing some of that by conceding, you know, the right to burn coal or, you know, make lots of money off of fossil fuels and so forth. Um, and 
And frankly, here I'm going to take their side again, or their perspective, not their side, uh, their perspective and say, yeah, if, if I really believed the right way for the world was, you know, for the America to be anyway, was on the right side of the political spectrum, then I, hell yeah, I'm going to be skeptical about this stuff about climate change because if it turns out it's true, then we're going to have to start doing a bunch of liberal bullshit that I don't believe in, right? And so, again, you know, the reason is just unfortunately such a small part of, of, of the basis of our beliefs. You know, uh, if, if I'm somebody, I'm thinking of these people that I communicate with on Facebook, somebody's out, uh, not even in Gallup, they're even more rural out than that, uh, Gallup, New Mexico, and, uh, you know, it's no amount of facts, I, I believe, are going, going to help change this woman's mind. Uh, I think it's a matter of how can we, how can we help deal with uh, climate change without seeming it, without it seeming to be a partisan issue, and and frankly, how can we get more of her friends to be talking? You know, it's as long as everybody in her little small community is feeling the same. You know, group think. I mean, and again, it's nothing against her. It's nothing. Against, it's humans are built this way. Uh, now, how to how to deal with that? I don't know. Do we? You know, should we be proselytizers of climate change and stuff? Uh, but the skepticism, yeah, skepticism is healthy. Uh, but skepticism, you have to be motivated to be skeptic skeptical. And if your motivation is keeping you from ever being able to acknowledge the what the data suggests, then I guess I don't know how to get past that. Yeah, let me say something about that real quick and reaching out one more time. Uh, when you come from another person's point of view, they are more likely to change their mind in this instance. For example, when I speak to conservatives, right, a lot of times they are pro-business, uh, for example, right? Well, we can have a better business structure if we do X, Y, and Z. Like come from it from their point of view. And it's, and it's a rational argument, right? Like I'm pro-business. I love business. I mean, I, I love capitalism, okay? But we can have green capitalism. We, uh, I, I don't know if you guys were at the a film festival, but uh, John Paul DeJora from Paul Mitchell, he's a, what they call a conscious capitalist. He, he makes money, runs a business, but he gives back to communities. He gets people educated. There's no reason why we got to like make this a left-right issue. Climate change, for example, right? Well, who doesn't want to not depend on the Middle East for money and oil prices, whatever? Why did we not let the innovators like Elon Musk and innovative people in technology and the sciences build better businesses? I don't know about you, but I'd rather pay less money for energy. That's more money going to my business that I can pay employees and do stuff too. There's all these factors. If we just come from it from a different outside of the box thinking and figuring out why is this person thinking that way that's how we that's how i think we can solve problems it doesn't mean we can solve all the problems but i think there's a lot more common ground than we realize you're not going to turn on the media and see this you're probably not going to talk to most of your friends and see it now but when you understand another person's point of view just like in a relationship right we argue with our family and our kids and whatever but we still love them we still care about them the sad part of, of everything going on right now for me is how a lot of us have lost friends and family over this. And it's like, what, now all of a sudden we're not related. Now all of a sudden it's like we used to hang out and drink a beer and do something. But now because somebody's in our political office, we can't talk to each other. That's not right either. And if we value things, we're going to have to get more past the political ideology and figure out how do we solve problems. And that, I think once we start realizing that your benefit, your benefit, your benefit, my benefit, and the better lives that we live hopefully make us a better society. But that might take a long time, and I may not see it in my lifetime. I don't know, but I know you want to talk about that. For uh, all I was going to say was, is jumping on the bandwagon of what Chad was talking about, taking the perspective of the other side. Um, really what I, I honestly think it boils down to, and in terms of trying to get people to change, is um, understanding that change is hard, flat, flat out across all spectrums, no matter what we're talking about, religious beliefs, climate change, um, even, you know, what kind of car you want to drive versus somebody else. It change in, in any regard is hard, but it's the thing that remains constant. And I think if we can get that point across and maybe like he said, take the other side's perspective, we might see a little bit more growth. Just my opinion. And if not, we're all going to die. So, <laughs> all right. I'll take a couple. Can we, we'll take a, like two more questions or if anybody's got any other comments or. Anything else or we're good to go? No? I got a doomsday comment. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> You're not going to start a cult, are you? No. Okay. <laughs> I'll join it if you want me to, but go ahead. You were uh, saying that you thought that you were evolving into a kinder, general, gentler people. And, and uh, you know, this Trump thing is kind of putting a damp on it, but. I thought we were all getting, you know, better, but if you just look at recent, recent history, we've killed over a million people in Iraq for no good reason, and 
you know, thousands of them and when mm -hmm. for nothing. Right. And we're not a kind or general, gentler people. Our government, they want something, they use us as cannon fodder and they go after it. I think it. I think it depends on the perception, and I don't know. Can you are you able to talk? I mean, I know you brought up Steven Pinker, and I, I'm not as familiar as him with him, but I know that there's people that people. No, I brought it up today, but um, we are actually a more civilized society than we've ever actually been, and unfortunately, we do have these things on the fringes where there's these problems. It's not to ignore the problems. That I would never say that there's not these serious problems, but. If you think about it, we're out of poverty more than we've ever had. We're feeding more people. Is there still a problem with poverty? Yes. Is there still a problem with war? Yes. But overall, if you look at the whole, uh, us as an entire species, we're doing better than we've ever done. We're, we're curing diseases more. We're more prosperous than we've ever been. We're more educated. And I think the problem is, is that with the internet is that we look at the media and now that media is being fed to us at every moment on our phone and doing whatever else, our brains, like he said in the film, are wired to see negativity. So we're, we're just seeing this, we're just seeing that. We're not seeing on the news when somebody came up with a cure for this or how many people were fed today because of this organization. And I think that our amygdala is constantly being triggered off by the media. And we're constantly being reminded, oh, this is what's wrong, this is what's wrong. But if you look at rational society and all these really hardworking people in the scientific community and education, there's a lot of people doing a lot of great stuff that nobody ever gets the front page news and, and doing. So you want to talk, in fact, he has a new book called Empathy and Compassion that's getting ready to come out. Maybe that'll tie into it a little bit or? Uh, maybe. You think we're more empathetic? <clears throat> you think we're more empathetic? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, definitely more empathetic. You know, so in, indulge me for a second and raise your hand if you believe that waterboarding is torture. Okay. If waterboarding, right, remember that, that wet cloth over your face that simulates drowning, although you don't actually drown, right, you're not going to die, you're, to my knowledge, you're probably not even going to suffer any actual medical problems, although, I don't know, maybe something, but what do you think, it looked like just about everybody raised their hand, yes, that's torture, how many of us do you think would have raised their hand 100 years ago? I mean, it's hard to answer a question, what would I have been like 100 years ago, but I'm pretty sure most of, <laughs> are you kidding me? Dude, that's like a walk in the park. You know, and, and Steven Pinker points this out, he says, now, and this is not, without even my, con I mean, yeah, sure, I'll go, it's torture, okay? Uh, but the point is, is that the fact that today we even bother asking the question whether putting a wet, wet cloth over someone's face is torture is evidence that we are thinking much more about this stuff and we're much more concerned about our actions toward other people. Uh, Pinker points to the printing press as the most important advent for the, for the decrease, and, and again, I love the, I always have to paraphrase this, I'll get the exact quote, but the very first line in his book, it says, believe it or not, and I know most of you will not, humanity is more, less violent than it's ever been. And he, he points to the printing press again, insofar as the printing press made novels possible. Yeah. And, and you know you know the difference between a good novel and a bad novel. The good novel is the one that you can actually put yourself in the shoes of the protagonist or, the, or whoever. And it wasn't until, is that 1400s printing press? Does that sound right? Anybody? Yeah, yeah somewhere around there. Uh, it, wasn't read more. <laughs> it wasn't until, you know, the printing press made uh, novels possible. You, you know, novel's not something you write one copy, you take uh, eight years to write, and then somebody copies it and makes five other copies. You know, a novel is something you can mass produce. And suddenly, on massive levels, ordinary people were beginning to read about other people. A way, something that was not possible for 99% of the populace prior to the printing press. And once we started being able to read stories about other people, even if they're fictitious people, we learned how to put ourselves in other people's shoes, and we're just getting better and better. I mean, you know, say what you will about TV and movies and all that shit. They're just other ways of teaching us how to take other people's perspective. And you know damn good and well, when you understand what the world looks like from somebody else, you can't be quite as mean to them. As, as you, you felt the way for. I, I love telling, my kids drag me into, uh, anybody in these torture museums in, in, in Europe? We don't seem to have many here, you know, but they got them all over the place there. Why? Because there used to be dungeons in every castle, right? And now they got all this extra torture equipment. Where that, yeah, so the Inquisition and stuff. And, and we look at them, oh my God, they used to do this? You know, and those of us today can't even imagine how people, but back then it was, uh, I assume this is true, I just heard it anecdotally, that it was common to have um, kind of a latticed floor 
on the, on the Lord of the castle would have a dining room with a latticed floor through which they could see and hear the torture victims below as they had their fine meal. So they actually used to enjoy watching this stuff. We can't even imagine that. So I totally sympathize with, you, with what you're saying, that yes, our wars have gotten more and more efficient at killing, and they seem to be done for more and more pointless reasons. I would totally agree with all that. But the statistic, at least the what the the... the the construct that Pinker works with is, what is your probability of dying a violent death? And that has only gone down over time. Overall, overall, and, and imagine this, this is actually, think about this for a minute. Think about even, what, 1945, how many years ago was that? Like, if I would, this is great news. Don't, yeah, don't yeah, no, no. Yeah. But would you, would you have thought, over 70 years ago, right? 71, 71 years ago. Would anyone 71 years ago would imagine that there would be a press conference where the leader of the free world of Germany and America would sit together and their positions would be almost be opposite? Think about it. Like, where Germany is the free world and wanting to free everybody, and we have a possible, fa I'm not going to call him a fascist fascist, but I'm just saying potential. But I'm just saying, like, in 1945, they would have looked at that was the end of the world. World War II, and, you know, that was a, that was a big war. And, and so far, we've been good enough to not go that far with it hopefully we can maintain it but it's it's all about perspective so yes i agree with you and these are problems we need to solve and i am absolutely about it but i also think we need to have a little bit of uh, a perspective so we have uh, really hope and i really believe in hope like real hope and saying that like we have gotten better think about it nazi germany didn't do what all of us as americans are doing right now in this country with this guy so that just goes to show we've come a long long way so i have a lot of hope for that hopefully we can fix those problems because they still need to be fixed too so i don't know if that answers your question or uh, no i'm good go ahead one last thing i just you were talking about understanding something from other people's perspective um i just read the book hillbilly elegy by jd nance if you want to understand how someone grew up in a hillbilly environment and got to go to Yale Law School. It's, um, he, it reminded me of the Grapes of Wrath in a way, but yet the language is a lot more straightforward. But it's just a book I recommend. It's okay. Elegy? Yeah, Billy Elegy. Yeah, so cool. Nice Thank you. Though. Okay. Definitely check that out. Okay. All right. You want to, I'm going to let you say the last word because we've been talking a lot. Oh, but good. What's your, thought, what's, your, what's your thought and perspective where we can move forward from here? Um, I think um, just continuing to have conversations like what we're having. Don't be afraid. I, I'm a, a huge proponent of don't be afraid to have hard conversations. Um, and don't, don't be afraid to challenge yourself by taking the other person's perspective by learning from, from somebody else who doesn't think exactly like you do and doing like what you were talking about before and really getting into what, what do these people value and how can we help them facilitate a better process of thinking about why they value what they value and how to get them to see that maybe what they're valuing could be shifted to benefit not only them, but the people that are around them. And I, I just want to thank the uh, Sedona Verde Valley Freethinkers and everybody here for being here today. And thank you for watching the film and being open-minded for being here. I really appreciate all your guys' input. If you guys have anything else you'd like to say about the film personally, go ahead and talk to me. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Mesa. Thank you, everybody, for being here. So. Thanks,